Okay, yeah, Tom, Henry, feel free. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Henry. Uh, thanks very much, David. Uh, am I able to share my screen? Do I have that? You should be able uh, to, yes. Let me just try here. And then for Henry to share his screen, you just need to, whoever's sharing just needs to unshare first. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll just probably get a riff off. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Go ahead, go ahead, Tom, you go first. Which screen? I have three screens, so I'm not sure which one I'm sharing. Do you see mm -hmm. a, a PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, we see a presentation. Okay. Let me just uh, put it full screen. Uh, did you see full screen for a moment there at least? Yes. For a moment, yes. yeah. Okay, now sorry. It, it yeah, not away. anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, it was my fault because as soon as I did that, it uh, overlapped all of the video feeds from all of the members. So I had to move that to another screen so I could see everybody and, and talk at the same time. So uh, thanks very much, uh, David and Martin and colleagues for helping to organize this uh, going into really a good explanation on the context and status of the standards for climate change and climate action uh, for folks that don't have yet uh
um, and uh, I've, I've been part of uh, startup, uh, I've been part of teams, management teams uh, at uh, one blockchain startup that was in, uh, called Novera Capital, which unfortunately we, we no longer aren't active, but we were uh, trying to get a, a Bitcoin um, investment vehicle uh, using blockchain uh, applicate, blockchain. Uh, and that was at Mars building, but that's actually sort of um, uh, sort of cease, it sort of slowed down activity, I guess, if you will. But anyway, that's, so that's some of that, of what I'm doing. And then again, I've worked with a lot of different uh, blockchain um, players in Toronto. Um, some applications, again, I don't necessarily code, but I've done some work uh, with Hyperledger. One of my co-authors, uh, Shivam, uh, had uh, created a prototype for Hyperledger uh, based application for, um, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority on their smart grids uh, site uh, in Markham. Okay. So we can talk more about that. But so basically, I feel like I, I'm quite involved in the blockchain development, both in academia, certainly in academia, uh, but also uh, well connected, I believe, uh, in, in the blockchain industry. Great. Thanks very much, Henry. And I, Henry and I first met about a year ago. I had been working on the concept of uh, uh, smart standard system for climate actions for a number of years um, and with the Canadian National Research Council or NRC who uh, connected me with Henry to do more of a deep dive into the conceptual framework and to identify ways to uh, uh, advance it towards uh, developing it and, and getting it out to, and people using it. So let me see here. Okay, so with those introductions, thanks again, Henry. Just to go over some of the problem statements that are really driving this uh, uh, this vision. Uh, so everyone, I think, uh, knows about the Paris Agreement um, and even the Kyoto Protocol going back to the late 1990s. Um, so, and I've been involved uh, going back that far. Uh, and at that time, um, all of the MRV that was starting to be built often from scratch was uh, um, really uh, stretched to the limit and being able to serve carbon markets and climate programs and policies. And often we would see um, verification reports being handed in months and months after the due date because they'd say, oh, let's have all the verifications report done by the end of March. And there's only so many verifiers who could be able to do all of that and the companies to report it. So there was just not enough resources available to do all of the climate accounting and auditing um, at a very basic level. And for a, uh, a program, the, the, the Kyoto Protocol, which was relatively a, a lighter lift than the Paris Agreement is today in terms of overall goal and in terms of complexity. The, the Paris Agreement is inherently much more complex. So we didn't have enough resources then. And now with the Paris Agreement, it's a much higher ask or heavier lift. And yet we're still struggling not to have adequate uh, data expertise, standards, and all of the resources related to the accounting and auditing to mobilize the resources, have the assurance and all of the rest of it uh, in order to achieve the goals that we have overall, you know, keeping uh, uh, within the, the global carbon budget uh, and being as uh, economically efficient as possible and achieving SDGs. So um, now we're even in a bigger challenge with our limited resources. So it's crying out for, we need to think outside of the box and really deliver solutions that are able to, to, to support the overall strategies and goals of trying to tackle climate change. And uh, we know the Paris Agreement isn't the finish line. It's actually just the, the starting line uh, towards uh, a sustainable world. And, and so even though the Paris Agreement is much more than the, the Kyoto Protocol, we have to go way beyond the Paris Agreement, and that's going to require a much more uh, advanced and extensive um, digital system uh, in order to, to get to where we want to be in terms of a sustainable world without minimizing the impacts that are already uh, on their way to um, 
to cause us trouble. So we've got that sort of size of the, the ask to the, the MRV um, uh, auditing and accounting community. Now everybody's heard of greenwashing um, and, and I think uh, there's uh, been a recent resurgence uh, um, uh, lately that I've seen. And a lot of people identify the garbage in as garbage out, you know, in terms of the data, bad data in, you're gonna get bad uh, results. And with all of the digital uh, systems that are available and we see data doubling very frequently uh, and that data is a new asset class, it's the new oil, but when the data isn't used properly, it becomes not so much a resource as it can be uh, a, a challenge or even uh, very dangerous and misleading people about uh, what that, that data actually means. That problem is, is actually different than the one that we're highlighting here, which is we're actually improving the availability and the quality of data uh, as uh, IoT devices and sensors of all types make data uh, much uh, more real time, accessible, uh, quality and so on. But we can take that good data and put it through a system of sustainability standards or climate standards that have not been optimized, which I'll explain later on in this presentation, and turn good going in through bad standards equals bad going out. And so it's not enough just to address the data portion. Uh, we need to look at the whole standards in that governance system to ensure that the uh, what's coming out is reliable uh, and has the utility and cohesiveness and, and other characteristics necessary to enable all of the stakeholders uh, to mobilize resources and participate uh, effectively and, and, and everybody uh, helping to get to the uh, climate or the Paris Agreement climate goals and SDGs more broadly speaking. Otherwise, and this is one of the reasons back in 2017 when uh, the UN um, had um, suggested we, we create the Climate Change Coalition, there was already uh, concerns about greenwashing and whether carbon credits are really uh, benefiting the atmosphere. And, and then we looked at uh, the general perception of digital solutions. Uh, you know, are those uh, tools for uh, uh, troublemaking sorts or are they problems themselves? Combining those two concerns really had the potential to um, turn off uh, a lot of stakeholders about the, the potential value that they could bring because they're just worried that they could be misused. And so really, uh, uh, we, we, we really don't want to see digital solutions end up making greenwashing look like uh, we're putting green lipstick on a pig. So the key messages, I think we all know how important standards are, generally speaking, like there's countless standards that are out there. Um, and they contribute uh, about the equivalent of 1.5% of global GDP, whether that's lowering, tra lowering transaction costs, uh, being able to uh, enable international trade economies, uh, economic efficiencies and economies of scale and so on. Um, uh, yet I've been making this point within the relatively young climate and sustainability space that's been around for about 50, 25 years, um, there needs to be um, a, a concerted effort to improve that system of standards that was developed very much in siloed, fragmented ways, not holistically, uh, in order to get the most benefit of those standards from a sustainability and climate perspective, not just from an, an, an economic perspective. And so, you know, in my eyes, and this is just my uh, real uh, uh, sort of goal, is that we could go a long way to increase the quality and the benefit of using standards. Not all standards are really deployed to their maximum potential at mobilizing resources in order to help us get to a, a, a goal like climate stability. Um, and certainly I think there's almost no argument about the need to decrease the time and cost of developing standards. They're prohibitively expensive uh, and they take often far too long. Now there's a great variation of different types of standards processes. Some can be quick and dirty, but lack kind of consensus or transparency or cut corners. So how can we maintain high quality of the process and high quality of the outputs of standards development uh, while reducing the time and cost? And I would make the case that as 
digital systems become pervasive, that uh, we will actually increase the number of, of standards that are needed uh, and operi operationalized at a very high resolution in terms of individuals and products, uh, rather than sort of just the global standards or sectoral standards um, on their own. So um, this presentation is going to look at not just developing standards, but applying the standards and managing the standards. So very uh, holistic and how to then um, transform the natural language manual implementation standards for digital applications. And to look also at the standards development process, how to look at the, the, the standard sector and um, uh, modernize how these standards and other forms of rules. So when I use the term standards for clarification, it, it means looking at um, uh, methodologies, protocols, guidelines, uh, and so on, and how to incentivize the stakeholders to participate uh, and reach some of those goals that I just mentioned. Lastly, here in this introductory section, the, the blue area, the top part of this uh, diagram is where we're, we're focused on the, the semantic layer, the uh, natural language standards layer, uh, and smart contracts. How do we create a new architecture and some mechanisms that will then enable uh, those, uh, those rules and standards to be more easily uh, uh, operationalized within distributed ledger uh, technology platforms uh, for different types of climate actions in particular, because there are so many. So I will fly through some of these slides because we're, we're limited on time. This slide here is just simply to give you a quick snapshot of the many, many uh, different characteristics of standards. Uh, there's too many. I mean, this slide here, I could talk about half an hour, but really there's a huge variability in types of standards uh, and climate action is no exception. Back in 2009, I've been talking about this, this issue going back at least that long ago, and I did a presentation to the United Engineering Foundations, uh, which are the IEEE, the Mechanical Engineering, Civil Engineering, Chemical Engineering, and so on, um, about this uh, this landscape, what what standards are available in terms of these levels of application or areas here, whether they're generally applicable standards or they've been made specific to project types or technology types and how many standards are available, how many do we need? And you can sort of get a sense of uh, the challenge. Uh, and I'd say that, we, that this challenge still remains, if not uh, even much bigger. And that was six years before the Paris Agreement. As I said, Paris Agreement is uh, uh, another paradigm. This, this uh, figure here is from a, a recent communication by uh, a group of sustainability standards organizations um, and really helps to um, uh, illustrate how standards and related governance tools relate to the, the various actors and tools. So the reporters, the auditors, uh, and the various digital solution providers. So it's really throughout that whole system. Again, in the interest of time, I'll be very uh, quick on that slide. Because there are so many standards that are um, that exist, many of them are very synergistic, to be clear about that, that not all of them, not even by a long shot, I wanted to give an example uh, of how these standards relate to each other. This is uh, from the Assessing Low Carbon Transition Initiative, uh, which is jointly by um, the French government, their ADEM agency, and CDP. And you can see, looking at this uh, diagram, uh, uh, following the arrow from left to right, how there are these global level goals, budgets, and how those translate into um, the, the way standards are applied towards a particular purpose or, or need for decision making. I consider the, the ACT initiative, which is a composite of methodologies, to be best practice. And if you, if you haven't made yourself familiar with the ACT methodologies and their frameworks and their approach, I highly recommend taking uh, the time to take a look at it. There's a few slides here that talk about how the differences of the uh, types of climate action standards I referred to. So there's guidelines and metrics and scenarios, methodologies, rating systems. I'm going to do this very quickly. 
Uh, physical risk and transition risk. We've only really talked about mitigation to this point. I haven't talked about how there's an interface with the climate adaptation field, which is an enormous area that really needs to have uh, uh, resources developed to help uh, it uh, uh, scale up. Uh, and, and then many other variables. So these slides are really uh, here to help illustrate how the there is this variability of different types of climate action standards and how that can be challenging to navigate through and to understand how they work together conceptually operationalizing them all in terms of all the data flows and making that user friendly cost effective etc is a major challenge that still exists and then of course out of all of those slides they still don't even come close to covering off the standards this is just a few more examples of major standards. Everybody, I think, has heard of the Greenhouse Gas Protocol and the UN with their CDM uh, project level methodologies and many others. So um, a, a lot of, uh, of standards related to climate action. This slide here just highlights very briefly how very, uh, I think it was in the last uh, six months for sure, uh, um, less than that, uh, the uh, sustainability and climate uh, standards programs that are shown at the top uh, agreeing to work together to help harmonize the standards and the frameworks um, and to work with established um, uh, professional uh, associations like the in the accounting and financial space so IFRS uh, to to support that process to do uh, to harmonize uh, those standards and address this issue that I've been talking about however I would make the case that that's insufficient to, to harmonize standards and, and set up yet one more um, uh, committee. We need a, a step change that goes beyond um, harmonization of those existing standards to reduce duplication and inconsistencies. Of course, that's gonna be very valuable. And I think we also need to go beyond setting up another committee or board uh, because that's simply not enough uh, people power to do uh, to reach the goals uh, like I call 10 times, 10 times and 10 times and that we really need to look at new collaboration and incentive models, which we'll talk about in the next couple of sec sections. And so how do we do, uh, what is a step change? And I'll get into what that means as a, as a vision, but to highlight some key points here, we need to actually restructure standards to be more modular for rapid, more agile uh, developments for uh, parts of the standards that are uh, evolving as data and other tools become available and our scientific understanding um, of uh, sustainability in the world uh, evolves. Uh, and then also to uh, increase the accessibility of the standards development processes to, to uh, enable more affected stakeholders to participate and to be incented to participate because this really is getting down to um, non-financial value creation and management that uh, every person on the planet has a, a stake in. So this is just a quick slide. I'd mentioned I had been working in this space uh, since at least 2009 um, and uh, showed one of the slides, but we talked about this, this issue we're talking about today. It, in the UN process at COP21, so that's 2015. And I've talked about this with the World Bank in one of their uh, reports as a co-author, uh, the Blockchain Research Institute, where actually I know Henry's also active as one of the, the researchers there. It's another reason how way we mean we got uh, engaged. Uh, likewise, what we're talking about today, even though it's in cut down versions with the ITU, ISO, um, and, and other journals. So um, really been making an effort to try to communicate this, this idea and address this challenge uh, because it will take a long time to materialize because it's such a fundamental proposed change. And so to get into the, the vision of uh, what I mean by a smart standard system, again, thinking about the full life cycle of a standard, not just developing it or, or just applying it, we're looking at the body of knowledge and the strategies for developing the, the types of, of standards, which I think will become digitally implemented in the very near future. 
uh, and and how they're to be managed in order to get the most value out of these these standards, because it is uh, there's billions of dollars spent every year developing standards, billions, uh, but they do contribute a significant value to the overall economy and to society. So how do we use the digital uh, tools to go beyond, say, Web 2.0 uh, or web tools like uh, uh, on the wikis, uh, document management systems and surveys and, and shared calendars and so on, which are very valuable, uh, but uh, don't get us uh, to where we need to be in and of themselves. So how do we pair up some of those solutions with um, with using uh, uh, artificial intelligence to aid standards developers and domain experts, not only on a per standard basis, but looking at a system of standards related to a value chain in a particular uh, sector, for example. Um, and how do we then look at so the use of IoT and AI and distributed ledger in the application of those standards? Um, how do we then, uh, which will be the next part of the section uh, of the presentation, pardon me, which I'll uh, invite um, Henry to talk about uh, in the next minute or two, how do we then use uh, semantic web uh, ontologies and standards and, and et cetera um, to bridge the, the system of uh, natural language uh, domain uh, specific standards like climate action to the digital world uh, to enable that level of scalability, interoperability, so that that entire system of standards development um, is uh, well architected, uh, compressing that overall time and cost from, hey, we've got some ideas for standards to help address a sustainability issue to creating those standards, deploying them and managing that system as cost effectively as possible. And the last point is to really uh, highlight that um, by redesigning the business model or and collaboration models of participants creating these shared rules and standards. So tokenizing uh, the, the value that's created with, by the overall system and sharing that value that it corresponds to the value add of these standards and rules, the know-how, so that the digital solutions uh, mobilizing resources and affecting change in the real economy that have sustainability benefits can be shared uh, equitably across all the of the stakeholders in a in a cohesive way. So I'm going to breeze through some slides there. I tried to uh, wrap that up uh, quickly uh, so that I I stop um, uh, taking up the uh, the time that we have left and. Um, Henry, if you're uh, agreeable, I'd be happy to either. Uh, continue to move the slides on your command, or I can hand over uh, to you the the sh uh, share screen option. Oh yeah, I can I can do the screen, so I can actually traverse myself. So if you can just release the screen, I'll take it. Let's see if I can now I do that here. I mean, you just stop sharing. I'm trying. I'll to. If, yeah. Okay, here it is, right? Okay, give me a second. There we go. All right, I think you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Okay, super. Oh, uh, yeah. So, how much time do I have left, uh, roughly? I don't need very much time. I just want to know how much I have. Uh, well, we have five minutes scheduled. I'm not sure how much more time we might be permitted, but. Um... Okay, well, that, that's fine. I mean, I'm just going to. the. This paper that was written, uh, and it's on um, SSRN uh, for you to look at, I think there's a, a link to it. It just sort of lays the overall framework. So let me just talk about specifically, uh, Tom spent a lot of time talking about uh, the importance of standards and how we can, so, uh, and how they could be used in, in future new generation information systems. And what I wanna do is outline, uh, um, go into a little bit more detail into the concepts. Mind you, this is just sort of a general level architecture. It's still quite preliminary, so we still need to, uh, you know, interface with folks like yourselves, try to get this uh, more concrete. But let me just talk about the architecture itself. So um, there are standard development tools, like a really good one is, is, is ScribeHub, which Tom um, has a great domain over. And the, but that's a natural language. So the idea, so what we know is this, let me start from the top and the bottom. The idea is, and because I come from the blockchain world, 
The idea is that if data that's used for quantification, that's used for um, calculating carbon credits come from blockchain, then we know that that data is immutable. We know that that data is, is recorded. We know we can believe, we can have more faith in the fidelity of that data. So we know, and if I think of established and preaching to the choir, I'm sure with this group, that we believe that blockchain has a role in, um, in climate science and climate change. The idea then do is that this is, blockchain is a very specific, very technical database. Um, how do we take that data, be meaningful data that's pulled, uh, be meaningful, not just meaningful for an audit, for the calculation, quantification of carbon, but uh, done in a more standardized way so that it's not just not, so that not every single implementation of use of blockchain for quantification is a one-off. How can we make it general? How can we make it more standardized? And that's the whole idea. Again, Tom is speaking about standards, right? So the, this, this architecture says this is possibly one way in which we could actually make this data be standardized, uh, make it more relevant, uh, and then actually make it relevant for the high level natural language standards that people think of. So what this architecture says is let's create these different modules that, that sort of connect these natural language standards to the specific data that's coming out of uh, blockchain. And they could be different implementations of blockchain. So what we then do is take a tool like a, a, a scribe hub, which puts constraints and which actually allows standards to be developed in a more constrained, more systematic way, and then take that a step further and convert these, these which are in natural language to different types of ontologies. What ontologies are, and they're gonna to use as intermediate means, they are computational expressions um, oftentimes in things like first order logic or different uh, semantic web ontologies. But the point here is that they express concepts um, or what the standards are in a way that actually leads to an unambiguous interpretation. So it's, this, is, this is natural language, this is computer code. An expression here requires a human being to sort of interpret using judgment. An expression here leads to a, um, usually uh, sort of very black and white answer. Yes, this is true. No, this is not true. So um, somehow we have to, and we're still working on this, convert these natural language expressions into GHG ontologies. And I separate them into two methodology ontologies that actually constrain how an audit would take place um, and verification ontologies that actually are used to uh, they're, they're actually used to determine, for instance, the calculation of, of carbon credits. So, oh, sorry, so, sorry, I have that backwards. Um, the verification, the methodology ontologies are used to actually, this, to see, these ontologies be used to actually calculate, for instance, how much the carbon credits were. Um, and this is what basically what a, someone who quantifies uh, output would actually, what, what they use in their heads this would sort of express computationally. So it's almost like an expert system. The verification ontologies are actually used to discern whether those audits occur, whether the systems in place are actually appropriate. So these, there are two types, different types of ontologies, um, but they both need to exist because there are two different types of standards. One that says, how should an auditor um, do the quantification? And one that says, was this audit appropriate? Do they have systems in place? So I discerned there are two different types of ontologies that are required. The idea then is to take this intermediate step from natural language to computational ontologies. And then furthermore, take those computation, computational ontologies, which are um, in uh, not necessarily, which is in the language, not necessarily specific to a particular domain, and then convert them into platform dependent smart contracts. So the idea is that we would actually have a methodology that would be expressed um, in an ontology based language and then convert them into, uh, use that to convert into IOTA smart contracts or use that and then manually convert into energy web chain or a fabric. Um, 
the notion here is that these ontologies are more language independent, less platform independent, or more platform independent than the specific platform dependent smart contracts. And in a large ecosystem, or I, in, a, in a world where there's a large ecosystem, and this is occurring in, in, in large scale, what would happen is that every implementation, every quantification using these blockchains, using IOTA or Energy Web Chain or, or a Hyperledger Fabric would lead to some knowledge being gleaned from this and then being uh, converted back into and embellishing these specific ontologies. At the next iteration, when an audit would occur, a quantification would occur, these ontologies would then actually have more knowledge, uh, more data, uh, and they would in turn be converted into smart contracts. So this, this stage here is quite, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure how this would occur, and this would probably be very manual, but the thinking then is that this intermediate step of having these ontologies makes these standards more computational, right? As opposed to taking a standard and immediately converting, uh, using the, you know, picking the brains of the auditor and converting it into a Tangle code or Hyperledger Fabric code that actually helps with the uh, quantification or the audit. You convert them into um, platform independent ontologies, which then are more persistent and mature, right? So anyway, once that's done, these smart contracts then basically these smart contracts embody the rules and regulations of the standards. Um, and then this would occur here. Um, that's, there's actually only two slides I wanted to speak to. That was one. Oops. And here was actually the other, again, I'm assuming that some of you are technical. Um, and this is more thinking about how would that work? How would I take ontologies that are expressed in a platform independent language uh, and that express rules and logic uh, and convert them into blockchain. So I, we've sort of thought about four processes for the interest of time. I think if you want to, I could have a separate discussion. It's in the paper, but that's one of the things that we looked at. But what's I think more relevant is this model here. What we need to do in order to get this going is, so right now, if, if you're a blockchain person, I'm assuming many of you are, uh, right now, when you talk, think about blockchain, you're really interested in a very low level syntactic level. So you're interested in IBC and atomic swaps. People that are looking at blockchain interoperability, they're concerned at the very low level, the syntactic level. At the structural level is the platform itself. Um, in order for this vision that we just laid out to occur, um, we need to start developing uh, data models. So um, supply, you know, I, I've said it, the semantic layer, supply chain data models, agriculture data models, payment data models. So here, if, you, if you're going to um, realize this vision, one of the first things we probably have to do is not just have a standard, um, is also develop uh, an industry stand, industry data model. So, um, you know, in, in more concrete terms, that would mean if you're using Hyperledger Fabric, that would mean that you would establish or actually have a point, a standardized, say for instance, uh, oil and natural gas data model. So I've developed an oil nat natural data model that actually um, is coded and encoded into uh, Hyperledger um, and that's required. And then what actually, and that would provide, you know, industry specific terms um, for oil and gas uh, and the, um, the ontology, the, both the verification ontology and the quantification ontology would be coded, would be written so that it's applicable to that industry. So one of the things about this diagram um, um, I would have to lay out is that this is, well, first of all, this blue layer, none of this actually, every single layer is quite difficult. <laughs> and, and I think it just needs, and, and uh, the more you do it, the more reusable it becomes. But um, one of the things I want to point to, what I'll leave with you, because many of you are hyperledger people, is what you know. If you're if you're thinking as a hyperledger person, what we'd have to, to figure out is how does this occur? What do these verification ontologies look like? Uh, are there existing um, industry specific data models? Um, and then can we effectively you know do an iteration of this process where we take these ontologies, you know, write smart contracts or chain code um, for hyperledger? Um, have it not be, hey, I thought about something, I just wrote the chain code for it today, but have it be um, 
delineate into a modular approach. Here's a GHG methodology ontology. Here's a class of smart contract. Here's a GHG methodology ontology. Here's a, a hyperledger specific um, oil and gas industry model. Um, putting those together, write some APIs or interfaces so that we start writing chain code that actually um, apply the chain code that embodies the methodology ontologies uh, for oil and gas and that is then usable as is for a blockchain that uses hyperledger that actually does the quantification and the verification. I'll stop there because it's probably lots of unclear things I said, I'm assuming. <laughs> we still need to, to work on that. But uh, I'll, you know, I'll leave it at there. It's probably as, as technical as I'm gonna get today. Thanks very much, Henry. And um, it, it is, there's, I hope there is a lot of questions that we could, that maybe have some time in order over time already to, to tackle. Um, while we're on the, the Zoom together, although we could also do it via the listserv afterwards. I wrote a pretty uh, plain language explanation of the um, presentation, posted it uh, on LinkedIn, um, but, uh, uh, and it's generated some good uh, uh, discussion, um, start, start some discussion. So yeah, thanks very much, Henry, for, that quick overview and I'd like to open it up for, for questions. Uh, Martin and David, how much time do we have? Um, I don't know when we might be uh, uh, required to end the call. Like, uh, the good news is there's no other community call scheduled today on this account. So as long as people want to go. Great, that's just good news. Thanks very much, David. Yeah. Uh, Martin, anyone so, else have questions? Uh, I see that Mark has his hand up. Uh, I was uh, mostly just going to uh, ask a question to see if um, uh, you can create a, an example of how you go from the, uh, so that we, we know what some of these layers will look like on the standards natural language process um, uh, at, the, at the top layer and, and some of the more of the computational ontologies. If you have any, let's say, exhibits to, to walk through. We don't um, have the exhibits to walk through today. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Henry. Oh, no, I was gonna say, just pretty much going to say the same thing. I mean, I have ideas, but we don't have any exhibits, yes. Yeah, so to the some of the points that you had raised, uh, uh, Henry, like having an appropriate taxonomy and data models at the climate action, uh, in, in the climate action space, and then more particular to specific types of, of climate action. So uh, what we've done in a different project with digital MRV is very simple uh, landfill gas methane capture and utilization for um, uh, electricity. Uh, that um, type of uh, specific uh, climate action, we would uh, have to, there, there are already certain uh, taxonomies because uh, th that type of activity relates to not just carbon credits, which this project is, but also uh, how the waste sector and landfills contribute to the national greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And then there's all the climate finance with it as well. So we would first need to create a, an example at that level. And then how do each of the um, uh, sort of taxonomical terms, uh, how does it fit in that, that hierarchy? relate to the existing standards, what are they doing in terms of the data life cycle, the application of uh, calculation equations and algorithms, how can that then be uh, related to the digital and uh, hardware or system that's in place, and then linking the smart contract implementation to the distributed ledger. Yeah. Uh, so let, let me, um, I, don't, I don't actually have, um... I exhibit, so I sort of have to be a little bit general. But what I would do if I, you know, as, as an ontologist, because I have a PhD, actually my PhD was uh, converting the ISO 9000, developing a, an ontology based, uh, ontology based ISO 9000 compliance checker. What I would do is uh, I would take statements, paragraphs from the standards, okay, which are natural language, uh, place some constraints on it, and I would develop an ontology that has specific terms and draws relationship. Um, so it's a if the you know um, I, I I would take a, a statement uh, and and I create 
sort of first order logic or some very unambiguous if then statement from this natural language statement. Right? And then it will be coded in what would be considered semantic grab ontology uh, language, first order logic, um, Sparkle, I think OWL, these are different languages in which you express ontology. And we then take that um, and I would then take that, make some assumptions and develop uh, smart contracts. If it's Ethereum, that's easy. If it's chain code, uh, convert smart contracts uh, and, and, and in the language of a specific platform, okay? Um, uh, what are the things one would have to consider? Well, how do you do that? Because uh, what an ontology does is it actually does, um, it's an if-then statement or it was causal reasoning, okay? Um, so very technically, one of the things we've considered is um, how do you, when you actually have an audit, right? Um, and some data come in and you have, um, you know, you're trying to do quantification or you're trying to do, find out if, um, Quantification is, I think, the big one, but find out if some constraints have been satisfied. Uh, does this site have these, uh, does this site have these particular um, procedures in place? So one of the things we're trying to figure out is how does that, you know, work in a very inefficient blockchain uh, with an ontology? So one of the things we envision is that the data would be coming in from, say, specific blockchains and the ontology, and then this would be on chain and periodically, possibly not probably not real time, but with some sort of a lag that there would be some off chain would be some ontology inference going on with the ontology. So there'd be constant um, back and forth from the uh, sort of assessment of, hey, has this standard been satisfied uh, and getting the data from the blockchain, right? And then running inference to find out if, if certain constraints, like for instance, running inference here, for instance, to figure out the quantification of uh, carbon output. Right? Um, again, I got a little bit too wonky, I, I apologize, but let me step back. What we're saying is that the data come in at the blockchain and because it's blockchain, you can't do computation, you can't necessarily do um, high scale um, compliance checking here. Um, the idea then is that that would be done uh, by the ontologies and that will be done off chain. So what's not shown here is probably some implementation, which is some on chain, right? Um, which would be directly uh, an on chain blockchain platform that would be directly interfacing with the, the data generation at the individual facilities and some off chain complications, computations that are probably occurring using ontologies. Thanks very much, Henry. I see that we already have three uh, questions queued up. Um, that might be part of your explanation. So I see first, Mark Liberati. Mark, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I was just presenting actually on the um, ITU forum and looking at the development of the ERC standards that have led to all this tokenization. And I um, was kind of exploring the, their approach on just GitHub and thinking around how blockchain um, could be used in having more decentralized standard making. And I was just curious on, on your thoughts on how we could think around consensus protocols upon, at least in your first step, when you're trying to come with the natural language um, and looking at more decentralized models than what we currently have um, and what your thoughts on that and then how that might then uh, link um, the, the, your cycle fully on chain. Thank you, Over. Um, so, and then difficulty, conceptual difficulty of using blockchain for decentralized consensus for standards is that the domain space is very large. Like when you're talking about consensus, for instance, something straightforward as Bitcoin or Ethereum, you're drawing a consensus on the state of the system. Like it, it's based, it's a pretty easy, um, it, it's a pretty easy algorithm to run to discern that, right? Whereas if you're talking about running blockchain, it'd be, it, it's, it would be computation inefficient to run the blockchain to achieve consensus. There's other means of achieving consensus than using a very expensive blockchain to do that. What Tom has in place with ScribeHub, that is a way of achieving consensus, which is, um, which is tractable because it's basically saying, hey, lots of people, have you looked at this? Do you agree? Um, using a blockchain to do that um, would be, in order, would be onerous and probably not worth the while. Again, because of 
the information that you would have to reach consensus upon. And you'd be better just best just to just to have people people look at it because ultimately what I'm saying is that the machines um, cannot discern, uh, cannot efficiently and effectively discern um, consensus for more complicated qualitative information, which is what a standard would be. Although at the end of a standards development process where uh, they have reached consensus, let's say off chain, um, and the, the content has gone through a peer review or validation process to ensure its quality, the ownership can be tokenized in terms of mm -hmm. a share of ownership of uh, a smart contract or, or natural language standard that ultimately becomes digitized and utilized in the in some sort of distributed ledger technology platform that is meant to create value uh, through some form of transaction and that that value that's been transacted could be uh, related then to the use of that smart contract on some form of terms of compensation. So I know a lot of uh, blockchain powered climate digital solutions uh, are using either hard coded in MRV rules or some form of uh, you know smart contract that the blockchain developers aren't the smart uh, climate experts. And so they could outsource that work to such a uh, climate standards community that's willing to come to a some terms with those blockchain application solutions and to say, okay, for every time you execute the uh, smart contract that uses our natural language code, here's the basis with which it's it's been tracked to compensation terms. Uh, and that would be sort of a, a, a middle ground type of approach as opposed to having everything say in a online scribe hubbish type environment be blockchainized. Uh, from end to end, right? So, I, I, Henry, is that uh, like yeah, you and I talked so about this think, before? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for yeah, pointing out. So, blockchain is overkill to achieve consensus on information, like consensus to to have an organic development of a document. It just it, it, it's not necessarily in of itself necessary for that. Uh, so it just, you know, I think there are better ways of doing that. I think what Tom talks about is a fair point is once that artifact is, is developed uh, jointly is can you find some mechanism by which you could, uh, you can tokenize that artifact based upon the quality of the input into it. And that's which, and then once you've done that, then if the, if the standard itself is used and it's monetized, then you could actually allocate correctly based upon the contribution of that. And that for, for doing that, Tom's absolutely correct. And I think it's a great vision. You could actually use the blockchain um, and, and do that. And that's an example of tokenizing that information asset uh, relative mm. to the value of the contribution of the people. Yeah. Mark, does that get to most of your point at least? Right on. Okay, I'd love to follow up with you afterwards on that if you're interested. But in the in the interest of everyone's time who's, who's kindly uh, stayed on with us extra time, um, I'll, I'll ask then uh, Marco Lopriano, who's also been patiently waiting with their hand up to ask their question next. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, sorry. I just. Uh, okay. My name is Marco. I'm calling from Brussels. And uh, um, can you hear me? It's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm calling from Brussels. And. Um, First of all, thank you very much. I think it was a very, very interesting uh, discussion. I'm not a technical expert on blockchain, so perhaps <laughs> I missed uh, a lot of uh, technical details, but uh, just to introduce myself, I'm a guy who has been uh, working uh, for many years on traditional MRV, monitoring, reporting and verification. Um, I work in the European Commission. I work in DG Climate. Of course, I'm here only in my personal capacity, but um, it's really fascinating to look at all the potential, all these possibilities that um, this uh, uh, application of blockchain could really bring uh, to climate policy. Um, I just would like, uh, I just have a comment and perhaps a question. A comment, I've already made this comment uh, uh, 
in, in another meeting uh, with Tom, but I think it's worthwhile um, stressing it again, because of course, you, Tom, in your presentation, you are quite rightly, of course, um, uh, underlining uh, sort the multitude of uh, standards, the possible confusion that it could be um, coming from that. And of course, when uh, I, presumably you're talking here about uh, um, voluntary carbon market or voluntary initiatives that are there, but I just would like uh, to underline that uh, um, beyond the UNFCC and the Paris Agreement situation, we also have uh, other very interesting uh, global international uh, situational environments that could be really uh, potentially uh, very, very interesting for, uh, for the use of blockchain uh, and uh, all, the all the other digital tools. The first one that comes to my mind is the maritime sector, the global maritime sector, which is run by IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which is really struggling ve very much in trying to uh, put on the table some initiative on carbon, carbon um, on cutting down uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I think uh, that is really uh, as a lot of challenges that can, that can be that can be tackled by, by blockchain. I know because here in Brussels, we are trying a little bit to extend the UETS to, to, to the maritime sector. And I can tell you, it's not like, uh, uh, it, it's not so simple. I mean, so, and uh, in my opinion, digital tools could really be interesting for, for that situation. My question, of course, not being a technical expert, I really, Anyhow, I really see the importance of what we are putting, to, putting together here. No, just my question is really, if we look at the real uh, world, I mean, we all know that technical standards are not just the result of technical discussion. I mean, technical standards are also a kind of uh, compromise among uh, extremely uh, powerful and strong economic interests political interest, geo, geopolitical um, uh, interest as well. I just look at what China is doing uh, in ISO. I mean, just to see how, how they are progressing really in trying to be in all uh, the most important uh, TC committee. I mean, so, I mean, looking at, at the real world situation, how are you going to proceed? In, uh, because, of course, the technical elements are important, but then how are you going to uh, put together a kind of roadmap in, the, in uh, facing uh, organizations such as ISO, for example? <laughs> I uh, first want to acknowledge your points about the human-centric, non-technical dimensions that I think outweigh the technical uh, often in the standardization process. And I think it's the re reflects human history on coming to consensus on rules. And I think we would probably be smart to differentiate between the different types of standards. There's management uh, system standards and product specification standards and so on. Some having less of the, the non-technical aspects to it. And that gets to my point about restructuring standards uh, to facilitate the um, uh, more efficient uh, deployment of resources in developing standards. I know ISO, that my understanding of ISO having been involved there for 20 years almost is that uh, it's it is conformant with the WTO's technical barrier to trade annex in setting up um, standards so that they aren't uh, 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 trade barriers, non-technical trade barriers, uh, and that the standards were and then such organizations were set up to uh, avoid trade wars and trade regulations that introduce so much inefficiencies to the global economy. 
So there's certainly uh, an understanding of that dimension that you talked about, at least from my perspective, in, in how standards are created and their role. But again, if, if we can separate out to the extent possible the, the technical elements that could be facilitated with these digital solutions and have minimal pressure, non-technical pressure on them as scientists or you know, realists uh, in order to uh, help us achieve our goals of uh, you know, sustainable planet within carbon budgets and water budgets and everything else. Um, I, I think that is uh, a logical way forward. Talking about it with ISO, and I have talked with folks within within ISO. I don't think ISO is the right organization to bring in the solution. I mm -hmm. would propose something that would sit right in front of ISO to create those methodologies in a systemic, dynamic way before something like a rubber stamping organization like ISO um, would have a role to, to potentially play. Because a lot of standards, like 40% of them are incorporated into laws and, and policies. And so there is a role, a valuable role for that type of uh, action in the life cycle of a standard. But uh, putting that into the development process actually skews uh, the quality and, and the time it takes to develop standards, in my opinion. Don't know if that's satisfactory, but that's how I see it after all these years of thinking about it. <laughs> no, if, if I may, I see your point, but Myself being a regulator, I mean, uh, working uh, working with standards. Of course, I can really see uh, the beauty of your technical scientific approach. But then, uh, I mean, let's be frank. I mean, uh, standards are are the result of economic interest. Are, are not only of technical uh, specification because I don't know the U.S. or I put as I put it, China, but all the most uh, uh, strategic oriented uh, uh, countries in the world, they, 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 they all uh, try to push their own uh, national interest uh, into ISO. And unfortunately, we as a European Union, we are not so, we are not so strategically oriented, but uh, no, just, I, I, and, I but, but again, excuse me if I say something which is not technically correct, but for example, if you look at the governance aspect of what we are proposing here, of, of course, then you have just a technical element, but then you have to consider also the policy oriented, the political situation in which you are going to fit um, that this new proposal, this new approach, which I, 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 I say it again, is very, very interesting and very fascinating, but you need also to find the entry point um, with those um, kind of interest group that perhaps uh, will will not tolerate very much that you you put uh, you put down a kind of parallel system, if I may say so. Oh, I fully expect to be hunted down for trying to disrupt the current system because of the economic interests that you speak to. And some of them, you know, those interests are totally understandable, like equity. But we know that that's not the way the world is right now. And, and people who are benefiting disproportionately are going to be upset by any changes to that status quo. But I think standards are also being developed for consumer safety. We don't want something to blow up on us or human health. How do we define that? Is it, you know, my toaster is not going to catch fire and burn me down? Or, uh, you know, this type of fuel is going to burn down everybody, but it'll be 50 years, right? And so um, I think it, it seems implausible in my mind that as we see the digital transformation help to reorientate in a more equitable, inclusive type of sustainable society and planet that how we make the rules and optimize those rules like standards, not just for the accounting and the auditing, this is true, but for the allocation of resources in terms of sustainable production and consumption. If we don't get involved in developing those rules, I think you named a certain place that uh, there are certain types of power structures that they could say, well, we'll make the rules for you. I don't think democratically oriented people are, are 
Just look at the role of G77 in the UNFCCC, the role of the Saudis, for example. I mean, uh, Russia, China. I mean. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I think, think whatever, it, it, this, 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 um, I think it's a, this is not a technical solution to a political problem, right? Um, because I'm not entirely sure they, they exist. So I think what this is, is actually, um, a technical problem subject to some political resolution. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point to, to raise. Uh, we're kind of just scratching the surface here in a way with this introductory presentation, but uh, super relevant points, Marco, and I look forward to reconnecting with you again, uh, sort of in mid-February and, and sort of collectively Thank you trying to figure this out. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was really very, very interesting. Thanks again, Marco. And 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 now going to, to Connor. Thank you, Connor, for your patience and raising your hand and, and ask to ask a question as well. No, no problem. And it's very interesting to hear uh, Marco's points there as well. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just gonna keep it quick. Um obviously um I need to read the paper now, um, but I'm I'm very interested in terms of what you know what you've presented here and the potential. What what are the I guess what, what what do you anticipate will be the next steps? Because obviously there's some sort of structural um, group that you want to spin up to support this, or at least Karad existing groups together to um, start thinking about this. And so, you know, as again, it's still early, but it's it sounds like it could be a great initiative to get behind. And so, what would be the the way to, in which to do that at this point? Oh, sorry, you're muted, Tom. Thanks, Connor. Uh, I think that's a great question and point to raise um, and that there are parallel, multiple parallel uh, ways forward, sort of at a, at a technical level in terms of this solution, helping to flesh that out in more details. What are the options and pros and cons and, and all of that? And then there's sort of the non-technical social buy-in that Marco helped to highlight, um, you know, it, it can be such a game changer, or maybe there's a continuum, uh, intentionally graduated process that um, uh, is necessary to get that buy-in, not just of political elites or powerful interests and so on, but ultimately down to individuals. And I'm going to have my personal perspective and opinion that Jesus should really be individual driven to the extent uh, possible, not just in the development of the these smart standards, but in the usage of those smart standards. Um, and, you know, that represents a, you know, inversion of the pyramid in some ways of how we write the rules um, for not just the economy and society, really. It's like it's taking programmable money, you know, smart money, making it not just financial, but the non-financial as well what does that sort of scenario look like? And, and so there's going to be, I guess, a third uh, a pathway I'm, I'm sort of getting to is uh, coming up with some of those sort of endpoints or visions that we would uh, think uh, are mutually agreeable to work towards. And then more tactically, how do we get there? Technical, non-technical. So I think the more we can all socialize this in a very organic way because I think mul multiple perspectives will help to avoid an echo chamber or some type of thing like that. Um, and the sooner we can get to it, the better because it will take a long time to get people to, to buy into what amounts to uh, uh, a major shakeup of how these rules, how we want to interact with each other beyond the economical, um, get implemented and how that changes uh, ultimately the distribution of wealth on a, in a closed system planet. That's a starting uh, response, Connor, and I'm happy to, if you're interested to uh, have a virtual, uh, another a meeting afterwards. Yeah, uh, I'll definitely take you up on that offer because I think that'd be, it would be great to find ways to start moving things forward. Um, great, thanks for, very much. For... So, so technically, actually, I just put this uh, to, to sort of getting at the, I thank you very much, Tom, because I think to sort of implement 
that what Tom just said in a technical level, I think there's what I would probably, I'd probably want to do both the top down and bottom up. So bottom up, what I mean is if there exists projects, particularly if there's code that actually does some of this, especially since this is a hyperledger group, that would be useful. So a bottom up approach, right? So getting together people with knowledge who've done this before, especially if they've used hyperledger and to see what, what the code looks like or what issues they had to counter. Uh, and then top down would be to, uh, what I've started to, do with, do, started to do with Tom, is to take a look at existing standards and then start converting them into ontologies, ultimately to say, how would a standard that exists in natural language look like as hyperledger chain code, right? So do those simultaneously so you get a sense of what that scale is. I mean, if you're going to implement this and use hyperledger as a platform for the implementation, that both the bottom up and the top down is what I would imply. Thanks very much, Henry. Uh, Martin, if you were about to say something next, I know. Yeah, we're, if, we're... if I may kind of in follow to Connor's comment, uh, and while you have the slide up, Henry, is it, my first question was was whether there was exhibits so that we can show what does it what does this the um, the natural language uh, standard look like in Scribe Hub? What does it look like uh, as a methodology ontology and 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 um, in in a smart contract language? A bit of a Rosetta Stone of of expressing it in different ways. Um, without exhibits, perhaps one thing that I that I would be think would be interesting for us to do here at the SIG is use this framework and and run through the process and take one example, um, either with a, a project that's already using a uh, fabric, like, like Henry mentioned, um, and start using ScribeHub to, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a full, uh, already deployable, but, but um, almost like a tutorial on, on the different steps of going through it, uh, just so that we could show how that vertical integration would would work. Um, thinking also on Alex's comment uh, on you know ideas for the standards working group here. Um, I'm wondering if if Tom, you and and Henry would would find that of use. We would just look at either existing project or a mock project that we could use. Um, select a standard from there's so many to choose and. And see if we can work in an in an open way using the SIG um, to to chart through all those steps, top down, bottom up, uh, in parallel, or even uh, chronologically going going uh, a top down. So that then it's like, okay, well now if we have to deploy this on 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 uh, on Fabric, uh, we've we've gone through the process. Just putting out there as an idea for. But that's an excellent idea. In fact, that's that's a, that was the next step with the Tom and I are going to work on in the development is to flesh this out because this, again, this is conceptual. So, um, I think I think to be able to do that in in a, in a very popular blockchain like five hyperledger fabric would be, be you know would be great. And of course, as me as an academic, that's a paper there too. So I'm all excited. I'm all for that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I also want to say that that uh, concur with with Henry and to uh, sort of also highlight that the um, existing standards development uh, world has standards for developing standards, and in a way, we would need to create such a new standard. And and how does this system operate? So that, to your your point, Martin, are we uh, sort of conforming to such a new next gen standards development process and system, does it meet all of our our criteria? Is it you know the openness, uh, the auditability or transparency of what we're doing at the same time? Sort of thinking ahead uh, to be prepared for that next step. Not trying to do everything at once. So I think. Um, uh, by having such uh, a process articulated or a standard for developing a standard and engaging others that may not be the technical folks, but the standards users and the digital technology users so that they feel, yeah, what we're doing really helps to address their concerns uh, uh, in, 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 which is a long list of concerns. Yes, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, what, what we have the opportunity of, of, of doing is you know, if we would have to set this 
for operation in the near future with all the right bodies, it would be very bureaucratic and it may take time. Eventually we need to do that. But doing as a, a demonstration uh, process internally, uh, uh, it, would, it would really kind of flesh out the pedagogical uh, process uh, or like we would learn from from that process uh, I'm yeah and and just I don't know we could use uh, solar wrecks uh, or something uh, or, or something that's quite quite standard um, and run through it with a with an example um, and we could probably walk through it faster and I'm sure there's probably some lessons learned that will we can come up with uh, to better improve the process itself, which could be, like you say, as we are improving uh, and testing and improving the standards for standards, which would be a specific kind of uh, Stripe, Stripe Hub uh, implementation. Yeah, I follow you. I, I, I think if I understand correctly, you're following correctly, the modularizing this uh, overall uh, plan and tasks so that we do these proof of concepts where there's Continual. This helps improve this part of the overall puzzle of, of the solution. I, I agree with wholeheartedly. As I think the most rapid, uh, agile development uh, approach to get us to what I think uh, is the idea that's being discussed here. Um, I, I think this is something that uh, Tom and I had discussed. What we're developing here is middleware, right? Middleware that sits between natural language standards and blockchain that collects data, middleware that hopefully will have some standardization or the, not necessarily standardization, but reusability. So that you can say, I didn't sort of think this off the top of my head and just create this implement, you know, blockchain implementation of it. And it's as good as what with knowledge was in my head. If Tom was involved in it, that's pretty good, right? But you wanna be able to say one implementation of this or two or N implementations of this is based upon some standards. And as it stands right now, the only standards that exist are natural language standards. And even then they're subject to the political whims as, as Tom said, but nothing in the middle, right? Other than some auditor like or someone, uh, an expert like Tom working with some implementer like IOTA, which is great for one implementation, but how powerful is that? And how, it, and how, how do you demonstrate that it's not that idiosyncratic? If you had this middle layer, which is what we're endeavoring towards, we could demonstrate that there's a certain amount of rigor, a certain amount of reusability, a certain amount of credibility in what's been created. Yes, and I, I understand it as, as such as well. Uh, I see very uh, similar architecture to our work on the open climate uh, system mm -hmm. as, as the uh, framework for platform of platforms. In many mm -hmm. ways, uh, your, your bottom side of your, of your chart shows different uh, platforms and different ecosystems, but it's that top top layer that allows the interoperability um, uh, among them. And so I think that there would be an amazing, just running through the process, just vertically with one example would be great. And, and uh, some of the things of uh, the work that we've done could also bring in value add to, to the process um, as, as ways to creating more ease of interoperability by creating, for example, um, a, a registry for schemas for data models. So the data models are, are, are registered uh, in the network. And so you can easily go in and, and query them and, and uh, as they adjust themselves um, and create compatibility among, among the different schemas and a whole bunch of other, other things like that, that that could be good complements. Um, just, just wanted to say that, uh, yes, I'm fully on board to, to help work with you, Tom and Henry, and then everyone else in the call interested in, in, work, in, in, in walking through a, a full implementation of this uh, as a demonstration process. I, I noticed that Alex has his hand up. Um, I'll pause there, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I know we are running a bit like long on this session, but I was just asking, well, wondering about something and perhaps this actually related to Mark Liberati's question as well earlier. Um, I mean, of course, there's a certain urgency to get all of this done because um, it is, I mean, climate action is long overdue um, and we are behind schedule anyway. And the sooner we can digitize, well, digitize standards and stuff like that. I mean, 
the sooner we can scale up operations all around the world in a trustworthy way. But I, so I was just thinking, um, you know, the usual approach to to developing something. Well, I mean, I'm I'm I, I'm not part of the community developing standards really, but um, from an outsider's perspective, at least please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the usual way people go about developing a standard is like one group tackles it, um, like they start off trying to draft a, a draft version of a standard and then maybe they have a discussion with another group and then some reworkings of the standard take place and then they have discussion with other stakeholders. And so it's going from groups to groups to groups and a bunch of people, um, you know, having these set points of interaction um, in developing standards, and it's quite a tedious, long process. And I think that is exactly also what Tom has been referring to, that we need to speed things up because it's it takes too long to develop these kind of standards. But, so my question really is, what is the possibility of actually establishing a kind of open source community to develop this, like a global open source community where participation is kind of um, gauged by the reputation that each participant has. And I think this is also where um, Mark Liberati's comment about using the blockchain in developing standards um, comes in because you, I mean, you can propose, someone has to put that first standard out or the proposal of the first standard out there and people can vote on it and say like, yes, I approve of this standard or no, I don't. And say the approval of that standard, like um, the uptake of that standard actually into operation, um, or at least that version of the standard into operation can be tied to a smart contract on the blockchain, which if enough people with certain amount of reputation um, or credibility has voted for the acceptance of that, that standard, um, then it will automatically come into operation and all, um, you know, data or whatever that is submitted henceforth on the blockchain should follow that specific standard. Um, and may maybe Mark, that is not at all what you meant, but that is just no. one of the applications I see. Yeah, no, that was a little bit what I was alluding to. I was thinking of sort of a, of a, of a DAO model with the, with the DeFi staking uh, upon which yeah, staking. you reach the consensus protocol. And you're sort of <clears throat> collaborating as you as you want to get, and you're moving away from. I think the other person was critiquing these very centralized models that are usually having, you know, very very you know non-representative groups or only state uh, state approved um, delegations that are going to be setting these standards and sort of decentralizing that by potentially the token holders um, of the ecosystem that you're building for those standards. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, I'm sorry. sorry, sorry. So, Sorry, sorry, I, I think I understand what you're saying, okay, which is a little bit different. I think the difficulty there is what Tom encountered, that there are very few people in the world, if at all, that could actually understand chain, um, uh, solidity and actual context of smart contracts. There's probably nobody, frankly. So at some point, if you want to do this, and it's actually kind of what we're saying, if you do want to do this, then you still need this middle layer. And then, you, then at that point, you have to trust that middle layer, right? Because just what we're talking about, um, once that's done, see what you can do, I think is true. If that middle layer exists, then uh, people with a certain amount of information can then actually have consensus about, is this a correct smart contract? Are the parameters correct? And that I actually agree with you. But if you wanna have that, then you need this middle layer because um, there's just what's required of the person making that decentralized decision like a DAO is just, you just don't have too many people that are such domain experts and solidity experts. Um, among many other concerns, uh, the standards development processes that exist or are being used right now, some are very formal, some are very informal. You can have uh, uh, people at the table who can pay to play but aren't expert in the domain. They're expert in negotiating and winning their side, and that's what they're there for. And other times, I've been in standards development where they'll develop a new standard and won't even road test it before they publish it, which is uh, to me nonsensical. And so those are just, I think, good reasons to come up with a better model so that there is a quality 
process, and I use quality in terms of not just the technical correctness, but in the uh, inclusiveness uh, perspective, including people who are the being impacted by the use of standards, et cetera. And I think all of those concerns should be taken into account. And then how do we digitize that to optimize that process? Uh, and not just in terms of, oh, let's make it really quick. That's fine. Henry and I get in a room, we decided on a standard that's quick and cost effective. Well, no, right? <laughs> Does that could fly? So um, how do we look at all those pain points, um, come up with a better system that uh, reaches as many simultaneous goals as possible, uh, and then improve that for uh, efficiency of the uh, people working on it and then translating that into the digital solutions. Um, it's a lot of work to try to come up with some new uh, models that satisfy that many pain points and requirements so that we have a, a legitimate rules development and implementation system that has, you know, honestly, the benefits that we all aspire to see it happen and the actual impacts that we need to see happen, right? Actually, so now I just realized, Tom and Mark, I just realized you are both actually talking about the same thing. It's just that uh, uh, Tom's, uh, you, I think if you wanted to do it the, the way the DAO does it, Tom or, or Mark is, so you're right. I mean, what you'd wanna do is you want consensus on the definition of the smart contract and the people that get it right should be rewarded for having gotten it right. And for the, and, and once that smart contract is used, uh, they should be rewarded for it. Um, Tom's model, actually, I just realized, is exactly the same thing, but it's at the level where it makes sense, which is, you know, there's no one in the world that can actually look at a smart contract and understand enough of the functionality of the blockchain and the context to be able to do that intelligibly. What Tom is saying is that you do it at the natural language level, somehow figure out a way that you can still tokenize that. And then once that smart contract executes and value is created, you trace back and the people that actually contribute to it get rewarded from that. And that actually- As a lawyer, I think in the yeah. future, you'll be able to take those smart contracts, Solidity or whatever language you're using and you'll be able to snap that into, into language that you know <clears throat> practitioners of, of law, regulation, et cetera, would understand in, in very, or even just the general public in very simplified language that uh, I think would support their, their literacy of the systems that are actually impacting them. That's difficult, but I can tell you, if you do want to do that, you'd need this ontology layer to work the other way. The ontology layer, as it's been described, is actually going down from natural language to smart contracts. Yeah. What you're talking about is probably an order of magnitude more difficult, which is re-engineering from smart contract back up to natural language. Yeah. Either way, if you're going to do something like that, you need this middle layer ontology. Yeah. 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 I, I want to uh, take uh, the opportunity now that we're a good hour over time to <laughs> say thanks Thank and you. that I, th I feel like we've got a good um, starting conversation, like so many points we could take and I hope we ma maintain this momentum. Uh, I think not only in the minutes that'll follow up, but uh, and some of the bilaterals or smaller uh, gets togethers, depending on what people's specific interests are. I, uh, uh, I forget who said it. If uh, oh, he might, uh, Alex, maybe I was thinking the same thing around an open source community, whether it's a uh, uh, Linux foundation supported hyper standards that help to bridge uh, hyper ledger and distributed ledger systems with each of the sectoral or domain uh, open source communities, uh, kind of as a horizontal uh, connector so that. Um, we, we can scale what we're talking about here with by leveraging all of the other open source communities, just to sort of throw that out. Mm -hmm. um, and I totally agree. This was a great discussion and I'm glad that everybody was able to stay on. I, um, in terms of your point about keeping up momentum, I did drop a link to the mailing list for the group. I mean, that is a place where people can continue this discussion. Uh, um, you know, we don't just have to talk in these regular meetings. So p please feel free to post ideas, comments, suggestions, ideas that are coming out of this on that list. Great. Yeah, I'm, Great. I'm at it now. Thank you. Um, I also got to run, but I said I, I, I'm very interested in turning this into a concrete exercise that, that we could do um, in an open way as part of a group that maybe that helps say, okay, well, here's a, the 
the, the, the theory and the framework that, that Henry and Tom presented. Now we've tested it and, and lessons learned. And that may be a good segue to kicking off, uh, you know, an open source initiative to improving, um, creating best practices and actually getting a lot of crowd development and digitizing standards. Because it, once, once we know how, how the whole process is operating and it's kind of a, a clear recipe, um, yeah. we need a lot of uh, help and resources out there to start digitize a lot of the existing standards. Yeah, I totally agree. That's, that's where I was trying to get to that standard for developing standards or that whole uh, platform, crowdsourcing people, but incentivizing them to tokenize their contributions so that they, when it has been applied it and actually achieves results sort of impact financing in a way, they get a portion of it because they're making sure it's real and that the resources are, are accelerated to action. So I, I totally agree with the, the vision, of course, because mm -hmm. I've been... Uh, it's good. I think the timing's right now with all of the other uh, parts of the ecosystem maturing that uh, I, I think this uh, vision has a lot of uh, potential in the short term. Yes, Great. absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking absolutely. forward. To, yeah, looking forward to working on this. Yeah. I, Martin, especially what you what you wanted to do was exactly what we need to do, at least from a research perspective. And technical. So right. thank you for, for suggesting that. Yeah, and this is always a great platform because it's it's a, it's an open source process, and and I think as a working group we we all want to move more to a a, a doing. Uh, we've we've been facilitating yeah. a lot of really good discussions, but I think this is a you know because it's hosted within Linux, a great platform to 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 do things and and, and publish them in, in 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 demonstrations and POCs, and then obviously. It, it really depends on where it spins off. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Thank you, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Have everyone. a great, great rest of your day. Thanks, Bye. David, for recording. Of course, yeah, I'll post it, it and soon course. I'll share the link. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Bye. Have a good one. Bye-bye.